This and all talks at the 2019 JavaScript for WordPress conference are brought to you in part by our sponsors Pantheon, a high-performance hosting platform with agile developer tools. Check them out at pantheon.io. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the uh, eighth talk of the Gutenberg track of the JavaScript for WordPress conference 2019. I'm here with Igor, who is going to talk about Gutenberg components outside of the editor. Igor is um, educating WordPress developers in his free time and trying to start a plugin business. And when he's working, he's building group, uh, custom WooCommerce solutions and other complex headless stuff. And with that, I will give it over to you, Igor, and good luck on your talk. Thank you. So hi, everybody. I'm Igor Benich, and uh, I will be talking about the Gutenberg components outside of the editor. Uh, that means using the Gutenberg components actually in a separate React application. If you have any experience uh, with building Gutenberg blocks, then you will probably know some of the components that I'll present, and you will also know uh, how they are used. But if you never built a Gutenberg block, then don't worry, because this is a whole new thing, and I'll actually uh, show you how to read components, learn them, and maybe even master them. I don't know. So let's check out what we are going to do. So in this talk, I'll first go over some Gutenberg components, what they are, where you can find them, and stuff like that. Once we are done with that, we'll move and learn how to read components, where they are. Um, uh, I show you also my own process process of uh, reading them and learning them, how to use them. And then when I show you my secret on mastering components, I will actually show you how to import the components in JavaScript apps. And when we are done with all of that technical stuff, we'll move on to examples when we are going to build forms, notices, upload files, and then later on, we'll also use the already built form component to build a profile builder. Of course, this all won't be a workshop style talk because all the code is already coded, it's done, but just an example on how you can actually use the components outside of the editor. So let's get on with it. What are the Gutenberg components? Well, those are actually JavaScript functions in in their in the base of it, right? And to learn about them, we can use the documentation or the GitHub repo. So if we go to this link here, we'll see that we have a reference guide on how we can actually use uh, the components. And here is also an example on the button. And each of these uh, guide on each component will some of them will have the design guidelines some of them or all of them will have the development guidelines and other stuff like that let me just show you for an example the form toggle here uh, let's wait for the chrome to load it okay so the form toggle this is actually the form toggle it's a switch it's an on or off component and we have the design guidelines, the development guidelines, and some related components. So the design guidelines are showing you how to use it and also how to not use the toggle. So you can see how this is uh, a good way to use it, use it for a fixed background, and the radio button does not really work here, right? Uh, then if we move down a little bit more, there are the development guidelines. And this is actually code that is completely separated from the blocks or the Gutenberg at all. So actually, this part you can use in a separate uh, application. And each development guideline does have their properties listed. So you can see which properties does a component like this accept, the unchanged, checked, and some probably others, several components have much, much more of it, some have less. Then let's uh, move on a little bit. To use the components, we'll have to use this uh, command line. And <clears throat> there are also some uh, other packages, such as the data 
compose hooks and the data and hooks are pretty pretty good stuff to use in your own JavaScript application because if you like uh, using or thinking of using Redux uh, libraries, you can actually use the WordPress data package to have something like Redux, but maybe even in an easier uh, way to implement. And hooks are just actions and filters that you use in PHP, but they are now, uh, you can use them to extend your own application. And when you don't know actually how a component is written, instead of using the documentation, you can actually use the GitHub repo. So let me get back to here. So this is the GitHub repo where we can see the source of each component. Uh, and actually the, the reference document, the component guidelines are built on top of the readme file in each of these components. So let's say the form file upload, if you go here, we can see the usage of it, the properties they, it has and what we can use and how we can use, but actually even we can even move a bit more and jump straight to the JavaScript code to see how the component it's, it has been written. So you can actually even find out more of the properties that you can use that are not even in the written file. <clears throat> oh, sorry about that. So let's now, now that we have grab the concept of the component of the Gutenberg component, let's actually jump on how to read them. And this is something that it's uh, a really uh, important and a good, good tip in my own opinion on uh, how you can move on with components. So as uh, I will use the model, model component as a reference here, so we can be actually a bit more specific in reading them. So yeah, we can use, again, the reference here if we want to, or we can use the master branch Gutenberg. Uh, when reading the properties on using the, the reference, the problem I, I saw with myself is that some properties are described in a way that I don't actually understand what it, the property is going to achieve. And probably because there is not a better explanation or just I just don't understand the, the description of it. So what I do, I go and copy the Gutenberg master branch. I clone it with Git so I can always update it with the new releases. And let's now see how we can use the options model. I will focus on that. And this is like a scenario. I want to build a model but I don't know how to use it, right? So I want to find in the code, uh, somewhere in the code, in the Gutenberg, how it was used already. And the options model is one that you will find on a page, a post, or any or on any edi Gutenberg editor uh, page, where you can actually check if you want to see the permalink, feature image, and stuff like that. So let's say that this is a model and it's an options model. Let's now jump uh, to the Gutenberg repo where I actually just, uh, I, when I don't know what to do, I just go here, I type the uh, model, press of course enter, so the visual code will search the model, sorry. Okay, it's coming up. And then I'll brow, I brow, will browse a bit on it to see where it's being used. And now I know that we are going for the options model, right? So I'll just click here and the code will show up here. Let me just resize this a bit. Okay, so now the model is here and I see that it's using the function options model. The options model is accepting a few properties. Is model active property, is viewable, or uh, a property closed model. Then if is model active, uh, I mean, if it's not active, the options model function will return null. It won't render the model. Once the model is rendered, it will appear on, appear on the screen, right? So 
what we do next is on request close, we pass the property close model. And that's all, in my own opinion, and while reading it, this will uh, call another callback that will actually close the, the model. In here, we don't actually know what that uh, function will be, but we do understand that on request close, this will be called and something will have to happen to hide the model. If you go down a little bit more, let's scroll down a bit more, we'll see this, whoops, went too far. Uh, this compo compose uh, part, compose function, that will actually call the options model. And we are passing the is model active here, which is checking the uh, the store of the edit post to see if the model is active. And if it is, it will return true and show the model. And the close model property is actually defined here, which will close the, mo the currently active model. So this model will be uh, hidden away. And that's actually how I like to read uh, components. And that's my, let's, uh, let's call it secret of uh, understanding how a component works. So we'll, uh, when you don't know, just jump right in the Gutenberg repo, type in the model or the component name, uh, which, whichever you need, and then find how, uh, how it's used. I, I, uh, I found myself uh, searching for one particular component through a lot of other components and usages just to understand a single property on how it can be implemented and how it can be used. So don't be afraid to lose hours and hours of reading the Gutenberg code, right? Now let's get back to the keynote and then let's see how we can import the components. To import the components, we use the npm install on WordPress package, WordPress components, and save it. Then, once we uh, imported them, we can actually import and use any component that's defined there. But the other problem is that we don't have any styles for the components. So what can we do? We can either use the compiled styles in, uh, in our app. We, we just import it in, a, in our CSS, in our SAS, in our post CSS or whatever setup you have, you can use it. Or you can use the SAS part. The SAS way is a bit, a little bit different. And you, when using the SAS, I'll show you what you have to do. But let's go on the CSS part first. In the CSS part first, uh, the good thing is that it's already built, right? You can use it however you want, but the problem with that part is that you are including styles for all the available components. And if you're using most of them, then you'll probably be fine with the 114 kilobytes of the styles that you include. But if you're not fine with that and you're using maybe one or two or three components, then that might be a bit of an overkill. And for you then, the SAS way of importing styles is a much better solution. To add the SAS styles, this way you will decide which styles you actually want, but it does need a lot more work to make it function. And why is that? Well, first, the first thing you need to use the, uh, the SAS style sheets, so the variables, colors, and all the the parts that the component might use. And that's not, not really a big of an issue, right? Because you can always jump to the source, go to the Gutenberg, right? Let me check. Just a bit. Let me check the, so yeah, to the Gutenberg assets, uh, assets, where it is, yeah, there and the, the style sheet folder. And here is, oh, here are the all, all the CSS, SCSS uh, files that you can move to your uh, local application, which is not a big of a deal. It's just a co copy and paste 
uh, stuff and I can actually show you on my uh, on my test uh, application just a second because it apparently slowed down a bit but never mind so yeah uh, this is the the application and inside of my app CSS right here you'll see that I'll have some of those in here so this is this is right right here the CSS way so I'm using actually the course right in it even though I'm using the CSS way of using this uh, of showing the styles but if you want to you can just copy all those styles in another folder and just import them. But the problem with, let's say, the button component is that it uses uh, some variables that have to be compiled through post CSS. So when you want this way, you actually have to make sure that you have the post CSS configured and that you are using the post CSS themes. And if you are using the post CSS already, then importing this in your post CSS configuration and using this post CSS plugin or whatever it is, you will have it configured in no time. Now that we have learned the, the way of importing the components, let's actually move to the fun part and that's building uh, our examples. So the first one is building forms. <coughs> In here, you can use various components, but I'll just use these uh, six components. The button, test control, which is actually a classic input, HTML input. The text area control, checkbox control, radio, and the select control. And in this screenshot, you can see that I'm porting the button and the text control. And then I'm building a function form, which is showing a form, the text control, and the button. The text control uh, accepts the label, and all of them accept the label. This text control also accepts a uh, type property, which can be a number, telephone, uh, email, or just if you Leave, if you type it without it, it will be a regular text input. Then the value is the current value of the input, and on change will happen when you type something else. For example, you can then move and set the state to a new value. The button one is a great component, in my own opinion, because it has several styles and also states. Let's call let's call them states. So the is primary will show the blue button. The on click, of course, will perform something. And the states are cool because you can type in that is busy and it will have a, let's say, a, a flow of different colors in it itself. And it seems then it's like it's working something, right? So let's jump to the examples following this link here. I have it already opened up. So here, and this is the example form. So I've built a text control and about, which of course we can type in whatever we want. Let's see, Igor talking, we rate it, let's say two, you can pick a color, you can set terms, and then you can submit. When submitted, you can see here that this button is busy, so it's moving like that. And also, if we want to clear it, we can clear it like that. That's all. Let's now go and see how uh, the code behind it, right? So if I go to the example form JS, let's wait for it to load. Okay. So let's scroll to the top of it. There are a bunch of uh, some helper functions and stuff like that that you don't have to worry about, but I'll go over them also. So we are importing these six components from the WordPress component uh, 
package. Then I have a helper function that will actually define based on the uh, past comp variable, it will return a com build component, right? So we can use it. Then I have some default fields, which I have done it here. And of course, I have done it in an array of objects with the definition of each component of each field, but you don't have to do it. You can do it just as well as I did it in the screenshot there. Uh, so yeah, the component is text control. I have name, I have a value, which is set to the fields and the fields name is uh, used from the past state. So the text control, the text area control, they are practically almost the same. The select control and radio control have something else. They don't have a value. They have a selected property, which will set the, the one value from here, from the options. As you can see, the same is for the select control. And for the checkbox, we have true or false on the checked property. That's all. So let's get on with the example form function. We are awaiting some past fields here, which by default are false. So if we ha have some fields passed, we will use them. But if not, we'll use the default ones. Then we are also getting the on submit property and on clear. The on submit proper property will do something with the data and will submit the form actually. The on clear will use will be called on the button clear to clear the fields. So here we are actually mapping all the fields to build them. We are getting the component from the item, which is have the each item is an object that has the comp attribute set to a component. Then we get all the properties of the item and actually played a little bit here. I used another component change well, which will use if set, it will be used to change the value when the component changes like here. And if that's not here, we'll use a default method to set the values. Of course, I could use the on change and define it in the fields, but I just wanted to play a little and show you how this also can be done. And then at the end, we have form actions. The button, which is a primary one, is busy, will set the state, which is by default is false. And when we click on it, if we don't have an on submit function, we'll set the state to loading true. And the default one we will will clear the state, the fields, uh, or all, or call the onClear um, method that defined. So that's it, right? Let's now jump to uh, notices. Notices are uh, also uh, something interesting, at least for me, because you can use them to show some notices on the state of form or the state of an application or settings when they change or something like that. So we can have here, I've built a success notice, error notice, info, a warning notice that has more than just the content and we'll see how that's built. And also a snack bar, which is showing right here. So let's for jump on the keynote to, sh to, to see how uh, this can be built. So the notice has several properties, the actions on remove status, and we pass the text here. There are also some uh, more of them, but I, I invite you to read the component reference for that. And Gutenberg to show notices and stack bars is using a store that stores them actually. And then when they need to be displayed, they're using the notice list and snack bar list component. Those components are just getting the notices in them and showing them by how they are defined in an object. So in here, in this uh, screenshot, you see that I've, uh, the actions are different. We have a link and a button. So when defining that, 
you can, if, if you put the onClick um, property there and have a method that will be called, then it will be shown as a button. But if you pass an URL parameter, it will be a link. Let's now jump to the code and see how actually this was done. So I have, I imported the notice list, snack bar list and button because the notice component and the snack bar component are not required here because they are going to be used within this component. I also created two uh, helper functions, add notice and add snack bar, which will use the state, get the state, get the set state uh, method and set the notices and snack bars to the state. So to show a success notice, I created an object with an ID notice, content is notice and status is success. And when we pass this to the add notice, we will we'll actually add it to, this, to the state. And then we have done here, we have the notice list that takes uh, the, all the notices in the state and show them. You can also see here that the warning notice ha is using those actions that I defined here. So when clicking on the alert, it will alert. Aha. And let's, let's try it out. Okay, it works, right? Great. So this is how you can build, let's say, a notice system in your own app without actually worrying too much a bit about how it works because you know already uh, thousands and thousands of sites, sites are using Gutenberg and this works fine, so you actually can use it in your application, right? But the, you have to note that some styles are defined just for Gutenberg editor. So, for example, in such notice here, without any new styles, the X button here for removal will be up to the corner. So you just have to jump to your uh, CSS and just define the dismiss to be to bottom zero and it will take the full height and the bottom will be in the center. The same goes with the snack bar list. It will be shown elsewhere on the screen, but if you specifically say to that component to be on the bottom left corner, it will be there. Let's now jump to the next example, which is the opponent files. And this is one that actually shows the power of the Gutenberg components and uh, why using them in, in a separate application is actually a good thing and can be maybe a good thing. <clears throat> and why is that? Because th think, think when, when building an application and you want to have an uploader somewhere, you want to drag and drop a file, but to, to do that, you'll have to use one or two or maybe even three libraries to achieve that, uh, write your own custom functions to do the drag and drop, to do various things. Of course, already there are libraries that do that, but just uh, Increasing the number of dependencies on your project is is not really a good thing. And here you actually have one dependency that will help you do the, the whole upload experience. So here in this screenshot, we are using the drop zone provider, drop zone and the form file upload because we need to, to drop zone to work, it needs a drop zone provider. It's built like that. So we just put the drop zone provider as a container of all other components. Then we are using the form file upload here in this example, and we accept an image. Also, we do we add an icon, and this is a dash icon icon. And then on change, we do something with the files that are here uploaded. And those files are actually the file JavaScript object. And then on the drop zone, Actually, this component accepts more than the on file drop property. It does two more callbacks on HTML drop and also on drop 
the on drop callback will be called when the other two were not called. And when the uh, all those three callbacks have almost all in common except what they pass to the function that's here. So the, uh, the first parameter is different. In the files drop, it will do the files. In the HTML, it will be the HTML. And on drop will be whatever we dropped. I think it will be the event, so we can use whatever we need from the event object. And the second parameter, which is not listed here, is the position. And the position is actually the bo uh, an object of values x and uh, y, y, epsilon, whatever. Yeah. So the the axis and the, the vertical horizontal lines. I sorry, I blocked a bit. So yeah, the position are where the file has been dropped in the drop zone container. So let's now check how we built it here. Here we have the select an image or drop, drop it here. So we can actually click on it and it will show us an upload, uh, a select of, of images. Let me go to the desktop and click here and it will show this batch, but we can also actually drop it, right? So if I go here and I drop it, it will change this image. So how I did that, let's move to the code and find out. First thing first, for the drop zone provider, I mean the drop zone, uh, its, position, its position is absolute, so it will take the whole screen if you don't have a container with the position relative. So here we have the drop zone provider, which is set to be on position relative and some other CSS styles. So we can actually contain, sorry, contain the drop, the drop zone uh, area where we can drop the, the file. Let's now go to the example and see how it was done. So, for this example, I also created a helper function, which is the image preview. If there is no image, we won't show the image. And there, if there is an image, if it's a string, we will just show it string because we will expect it to be uh, the path to the image. And if it's not, we will expect it to be a file object from which we create the object URL. Of course, in the real world scenario, you you won't trust this file, you will have more checks and stuff like that, but just for this showing purposes, I made it pretty simple. So on the example upload, we have the drop zone provider, the same as in the screenshot above. So we have the on change, we set the state to the first file because we accept only one file. And on the drop zone, we get the first from the file list object, which is the file object, the file JavaScript object. And that's it. That's the whole thing. So you can see in just a few lines of importing the components, putting them here, writing a simple function, writing some CSS, and we have it all done. It works well and fine for what we need, right? Of course. I invite you to go and search for the form file upload because um, this is a complex component. It has a lot of properties, such the accept one, and it's, we can also manage how to render that component. So if we pass a render, uh, a render property here, we will uh, we'll receive a property that is on file change and which will have uh, which we will have to call when we want to show the screen to select the file and upload it. But other than that, we can completely change the appearance of it. And actually, Gutenberg does use that to change its appearance with the media uploader. So if you go to the Gutenberg and use the image uploader uh, block, you will actually use the form file upload, but it's just rendered differently for you to have more options just 
to paste to to enter a link to the image to cancel the whole thing or to drop the image there or whatever you you want so that's a really powerful component and i do invite you to check it out and browse a little on how gutenberg does it and then on the change uh, or on the files on the files um, on the files drop uh, property you can add your uh, your function that will check the file check if everything is correct the size the the size of it the ratio maybe of the image and then you will move it up to the server and upload it right there but of course here we don't do that and then let's move on the last example which is the profile builder so in here we'll use the example form which we have built previously we'll use again the drop zone provider and drop zone and we'll use another component which is a placeholder that also can have several things in it but we'll just show an icon if there is no image so instead of going through this screenshot here i'll jump first to the example and then we'll go to the code so let's see the example profile we have a form and this actually is the form we have built previously and then we have a placeholder of course i've since we're using only the drops on here, the on-click will not work here. But if I go here and drop a file, it will show the file here. If and then type name and last name, we'll see here, show position. And let's something about me. A new line. Of course, this new line is not a text area part. It's something that I've built uh, to to make it in new new lines when showing the text. Uh, and then we can actually submit here. When submit, we are saving it. And remember that wasn't the case in the previous form example. This is something we pass on. And when we clear, we click on clear, everything is cleared. Pretty, pretty simple operation, but it will show you, uh, let's, I will show you now how we did it with very few lines of code. Let's now go to our example profile. Let's go up, 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 up. Okay, so you can see that we are importing the drop zone, drop zone provider, and the placeholder. And we are also importing the example from example form from the before uh, example. Then again, I have built an image preview, but this time uh, I will show something if there is no file. This time I'm showing the placeholder component, which has the icon format image and the label placeholder other helper functions here are just a way to check if we have any data and if we do then show the data if not show a placeholder again such as enter name or just show don't show anything so in the example profile component we are using we are defining a default state like that we are defining the get fields and clear state uh, functions the clear state function will reset the state to its initial uh, values and the get fields will actually return the fields we have uh, we want to show so for example the first name here is a text control component and if you remember before i had a value change uh, a value change property that we actually removed it there and here we are setting it so we can set the state to this state and not to the component state before so in this state we'll set the first name and the example form component will remove this value change as a property and use it on the on 
on change property because we build it like that. So we have all these uh, components, definitions uh, for our profit builder. Then when rendering, we get those fields. We first build the whole profile header where we have the image right here. We then use the drop zone provider in in the image, use the drop zone on files drop, and when the file has been dropped, we set the image to the first file in the file list object. And then we use the image from the state here above. We use it in this function to actually preview it. And then we have these helper functions to actually show the first name, last name, and the position, and the profile about uh, functions all here to provide this an about text. And then with the uh, with the usage of our previously defined example form, we are actually passing the fields in the past fields property. So we are rendering now these fields and not the default ones. We are then passing the on submit property, which is just saying an alert and it says saving and on clear will actually clear the state. And that's how you can actually use the Gutenberg components to build various user experiences in separate React applications with fewer line of codes as possible. And of course, you don't even have to use the styling of, uh, of Gutenberg. You can use your own styles. It will require a bit of work to do that, but you'll you'll be able to do it. So to wrap it up, you can learn more on, uh, on components from me in my tutorials where I talk about Gutenberg components in general, how you can use one of them such as autocomplete or tag field or something like that. And you can also see how I use those components in a separate headless WordPress application. And if you want to learn or find me, learn more about me, you can check my uh, WordPress.org profile, my Twitter, and my GitHub, uh, GitHub profile. And when I'm not working on my daily jobs on as a contractor to other, for other companies, I actually love building my business up, my plugin business, which is, consists of the simple giveaways and simple sponsorships plugins, and I'm also working on a new headless WooCommerce course, which might be interesting to some of you, so you can check it out. Um, that will be all from me. If you want to, to ask me some, you can ask me now, or later on in the Slack, I'll try to catch up and answer some of the questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for everything you shared. This has been amazing. Thank you.